Okay, I was, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, I was born in Portland, and uh, I was in the fruit and produce business for 17, 18 years, and then I decided to go fishing for some unknown reason, and I moved to Newport, Oregon. I bought a small 34-foot boat, and uh, I stayed in Newport, and then I built a new boat, which was 46-foot boat. And that same year, which was 1940, I purchased another boat, which was a 60-foot boat that I ended up with for 20 years. Uh, in 1946, I came south, as far south as Point Conception. Normally, our fishing range, I was fishing for shark at that time, soup fin shark. We'd stop at the Fairlands, but for some unknown reason, I wanted to come down this far just to view and see the country. That's the sailors uh, always enjoy seeing new ports, new harbors, and new people. And we were fishing about 100 miles outside of uh, Point Conception, flat, calm day. We'd been out 29 days, and uh, my crewman said that he heard a strange whistle from somewhere. There was not a boat in sight that we could see. And uh, 100 miles outside of Point Conception is actually no man's land because the steamers all take the steamer route, which is 19, 18 miles offshore in, from the coastline, and seldom do you ever see a ship out there. So he heard this sound again, and uh, I got up on the flying bridge, took my binoculars, and in the horizon I could see a little stick, you know, what appeared to be a buoy or something. And I said, maybe there is something out there. So I started up, and we moved out there. We had, I had a crew, actually, of four men. We were shark fishing. And we went out, and sure enough, there was a boat from San Francisco with five men aboard, no radio. And uh, he didn't have a, a, any idea of how he was going to get into port because he couldn't contact the Coast Guard. At that time, we had no Coast Guard here, and, and the only Coast Guard that could respond was in San Francisco. I had a long-range marine radio, and I called him, and, and they suggested that maybe somebody better take him into port because they could never find him. We didn't have the sophisticated equipment in those days that we have today, like Lorenz and GPS equipment. It, it just wasn't available. And uh, so I decided I would take him in. I looked at my chart. I had no plans of coming in to, you know, to any harbor down here. I wanted to go back to San Francisco. And uh, so I looked at my chart, and I see Moore Bay was a landlocked harbor. So I called the, card, but, uh, the Coast Guard, but it also showed that it was a restricted area, Navy restricted area. So I called the Coast Guard again, and I said, I see by my chart that this is a restricted area. And he said, no, he said, it's open now. He says, you're welcome to take the boat in. And they thanked me for it, and, and, uh, and that was how I came into Moore Bay. And, and it was love at first sight. It was small. It was quaint. It was just absolutely beautiful. And above that, uh, the people were all just so warm. There was only about maybe 900 people here then. And uh, everybody was talking about the big boats. I had the 65-footer, and the fellow I towed in, he was about 60-foot. And uh, we would walk up town. Everybody knew we were new people in town, and everybody would welcome us, and it was just glorious, really. I mean, the warmth of the people and everything. And I thought, boy, I really love this place. I'm going to move here. So uh, next day, I we went up, and we got a haircut, shave, because we'd been out 29 days. and. And uh, I asked the barber, I said, do you know where there's a house for sale around here? Because there were just a few houses, just a speckled here and there. He said, yeah. I said, uh, my friend down here at the grocery store, Bert Wadhams, he said, has a home. It's pretty new. He said, for sale. And I said, oh, gee, I'll go down and talk to him. So I did. I went down and I said, uh, you're Bert Wadhams? He says, yes. He said, oh, you're the fellow with that new boat here in town? He said, yeah. He said, what's on your mind? I said, I'm interested in a home. I understand you have one for sale. He said, yeah, I do have. He said, uh, I have a home for sale. My wife passed away. And he said, I would uh, like to sell it. He said, memories are bothering me. And I said, OK. So I said, when can I look at it? Do you want to go now? And I said, yeah, but you've got the grocery store here. Oh, well, that's all right. He said, he put the padlock on the grocery store and we went up to look at the house. And I saw it. It was a brand new home, just one year, small place, just one block here from where I live now. And uh, I looked down at someone to take it. He said, well, you haven't talked to your wife yet about it. And I said, I'm not going to. <laughs> I said, this is it. I said, I want this home. So he said, OK, fine. So I gave him a deposit. And 
and I had to call my wife, and I said, we've moved. And she said, you've moved? What do you mean? She, I, I'm not a joking type person anyway. She said, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? And I said, well, I, I found a place in Moore Bay, and of course, we never knew where Moore Bay was. I said, where's that? It's by San Luis Obispo. And where's that? You know, so it was really just one of those things, and, uh, and I was very serious. We bought the house, and, and that was 1946. And uh, there was about maybe eight, nine hundred people here at that time. How, how much time elapsed from your arrival to the time that you purchased this home? The second day. The second day. <laughs> the second day, right. Uh, I, we, we came in that day, and uh, the next day we went up to clean up. The beauty of it was that these fellows were on this fishing boat. They were Italian fishermen from Monterey, uh, from San Francisco, actually. And uh, they had one chef on there, and he was a restaurant chef in New York. So that night they went out and they got crabs, they got the pismo clams, they got uh, uh, gooey duck clams in the bay, and they made the best chapine my crew and I ever tasted in our life. Great. The next day, here comes two young gals, and they bring us a big basket of fried chicken and a salad. And, oh, wow. You know, it was just absolutely fantastic. It, uh, the warmth, the charm, the atmosphere in the harbor. It was, at that time, there was actually none of the larger boats were here. There was a small fleet of maybe, I'd say, 40 to 50 abalone boats. That was the bulk of the fishing fleet here then. And uh, they were all very nice people, you know, and they'd all come over and see us, and people would come over to look at the boats. At that time, there was only uh, two docks. There was the North Tee Pier, the South Tee Pier. The North Tee Pier was still used by the Army at that time. They had landing craft there, and the South Tee Pier was available. And from Beach Street to the South Tee Pier there, just a matter of two blocks, was all eucalyptus piling there. And that's where we could tie up and, and uh, you see, the country was just, uh, it was just fascinating. And the artists would be lined up all along the waterfront there, just drawing pictures of the rock and, and our boats that were there. And, and uh, it, was, it was great. You said 40 to 60 abalone boats? I'd, I'd say between 40 and 50, probably, 40 yes. 50. It was a big fleet of that's abalone boats. That's pretty substantial. Very substantial, right. Great production of abalone at that time. Did, did you ever participate in that fishery? Never did, no. Yeah. No, that was strictly the business of diving, right. and I never did participate in that. Did you want to? No, I never had the urge to. No, I was interested in different types of fishing, so I wanted... Uh, uh, I was doing soup, soup fin fishing, which was sharks, and the livers were used for vitamin A. And the service, the Army and the Navy, they would use this heavy concentration of vitamin A for, for aviators and different things for night. Uh, uh, for example, a pound of shark liver would have from 20 to 40 million units of vitamin A in one pound of shark livers. And the average shark liver for a male was five to six pounds, seven pounds. The females had very large livers, but their vitamin A was very low. So, so you're targeting specifically on soup fins? Soup fin sharks, right. Uh -huh. And what uh, type of gear were you using? to? to we were using drift nets. In the summertime, in shot stuff. Sit over here, so just pretend like I'm not here. Okay. Okay, so guys don't keep me. Probably rather, he'd probably rather look at you than me. <laughs> <laughs> She's very pretty. <laughs> You're the one who's got the, the topic. You know yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Joe, tell me about your drift netting for uh, sharks. Yeah, we drift netted in the summertime. Um, that is, we had probably a mile, 6,000 feet of netting. And this netting, we would drift about six fathoms, that's 36 feet, below the surface. So if steamers were going by, they, they would not cut the nets. And, uh, and we would fish that in the summertime. Uh, and we would fish all the way from 15 miles to 100 miles offshore. And we always picked the color of the water that we'd like and the temperature of the water, around 62 degrees and, and dark, kind of a greenish colored water. Then that was the type of waters that we could find the soup and shark in. In the wintertime, then we'd use what they call divers. And the, these nets were anchored to the bottom in uh, say 100 to 200, 300 feet of water. And the sharks would be, in the wintertime, they would get down maybe to mate or whatever. And so in the wintertime, we'd use divers and 
in the summertime we would use what we call floaters and that was drifting on top of the surface and uh, the sharks were all the way from uh, Alaska to Ketchikan we would fish as far south as, as Point Conception I mean we roamed all those areas uh, for shark at that time. You mentioned one mile of gear that's a standard today was it uh were regulated at that time as well? There were no regulations then, none. You could move in any direction laterally that you wanted to go. If you didn't like shark fishing, you could go to albacore fishing, you could go to trawling. Uh, there was no permits, no quotas, no nothing. Uh, the ocean was free, you could just have all the freedom you wanted to do whatever you wanted. I began with my little boat fishing albacore and then I built a bigger boat fishing albacore and shark. I sold that boat and then I decided to go trawling. And trawling didn't pay out. We were getting three cents a pound for Red Rock, three cents a pound, and then the buyers dropped it to two cents a pound. I said, oh, to heck with that noise. And so then we went to uh, fishing sharks and, and I did real good at it. So your market for uh, rockfish at that time was that more of a, like a local uh, marketing of the products? Uh, well, the shark, you mean the, the red rock cod, right. there, was a, there was a market for rock cod, not necessarily uh, in where we lived, because, you know, we would go out trawling and we'd get uh, 50, 60,000 pounds of rock cod. The main market was Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco. They would fillet, the big canneries would fillet and then ship uh, south. I mean, and now you have such a diverse market because you have Asians, you have uh, Vietnamese, you know, thousands of them, you know, and, and they're great fish eaters. So the market has diversified a great deal and that's opened the market. At that time when I was fishing, it wasn't trying to catch a fish, it was selling it. There was too much. And, uh, and the dealers, uh, the buyers couldn't pay the price. Imagine, $40 for a ton of red rock. I mean beautiful red rock. But it was nothing to go out and get a tow with 20,000, 15,000 pounds of uh, red rock. I mean, it was just, uh, the market was uh, not there anymore. And, and, uh, was part of that the transportation system? Between, well, you mean to sell? To, between here, Morro Bay to Los Angeles? Well, at that time I was fishing in Newport, Oregon. Newport, I, didn't, I didn't trawl down here. I was oh, fishing okay. in Newport. And yes, the fish were trucked to mainly Los Angeles markets and San Francisco somewhat, but Los Angeles was at that time a major market for the fish buyers because there was more foreigners in, uh, in Los Angeles and there were some in San Francisco, but they also had markets as draw trawlers of their own and uh, fishing there and, and Los Angeles didn't have it because there wasn't uh, rock fishing south of uh, San Francisco very much then. It was just kind of an open market for, for our fish. Seattle was a big producer, Canada was a big producer, and when everybody started shipping, then the market would just drop down to nothing. So that was... Uh, you mentioned uh, abalone was a su substantial part of the fleet here uh, at that time. What other fisheries were operating out of Morro Bay in, the, say, the late 40s, early 50s? Well, abalone was actually the mainstay of the fisheries here. Uh, in the 40s, uh, let's see, like I came here in 46. Later, uh, in the 50s, probably in the mid-50s, in the latter part of 50s, then the bigger boats began to move in, and a limited amount of trawling started. There was a little crab fishing uh, that was uh, started too. There was uh, pretty good little areas of crabs. That's Dungeness crabs and rock fishing and uh, and the little. There were smaller boats too that, that did what we call long lining. Bill Wilson, one of the real old timers here, had a little boat, the Lucky Boy, and he would long line for a uh, lingcod. Mm -hmm. He'd go out to Church Rock, and one time we came in in dense fog and. And we heard this little boat chug, and he had a one-cylinder engine in it. And we went by it, and sure enough, here was Bill Wilson pulling all this thing, and just link cod just hanging down there, big ones, two feet, three feet long, and, and the lines were just loaded, and he was just pulling them up, you know, and couldn't believe it. But... Um, I recall that boat. It had a one-cylinder Hicks engine. You one-cylinder Hicks, yeah. right, yeah. Uh, do you recall the name of that? Lucky Boy. Lucky Boy. Lucky Boy, yes. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, lucky boy. You could hear it coming for yeah. you know, a long ways away. If you heard the African Queen, seen the movie The African Queen, 
and did that. This was a replica of that boat. You could hear it chugging down the bay. Sometimes be dense fog, and you hear ka ka You know, it was just it was just a great sound. Yeah, really. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when when did you decide to get into the marine supply business? Uh, that was 1960. I sold my boat in 1959, in the fall of 59. I finished the albacore season. I had a good season, and uh, I thought I fished 21 years, and uh, it's time to do something else. And I, I used to keep my boat up on the Sacramento River for a long time, uh, up at Pittsburgh. And, and when I'd come down, the guys wanted me to pick up engine parts and starters and generators in San Francisco, and I'd have my pickup loaded coming down. And so one day I thought, golly, maybe this might be a good business to go into. You know, there's, there was a marine store here then, Hortons, and, and he wasn't really a, a supplier very much. And, and at that time I thought, well, maybe with my experience and my background, my knowledge of the fishing fleet and, and things, maybe I should do this. So I built my store there, and, and it's still there. That was 1960, and my son so I operated since 1972. That's when I retired. And the business was lucrative then. I mean, it was really good. Materials were cheap, about a tenth of the cost of what they are now. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a lot of boats, a lot of business, ship stuff everywhere. And now it saddens me very deeply to go in and see, you know, the store just, uh, it's just practically nothing left. Maybe salmon fishing, hopefully it'll pick up, but uh, we don't know. Salmon fishing here has gotten to be quite a, a good fishery uh, seasonally. That wasn't occurring in the 50s? Uh, no, it was not. No, hardly anyone fished salmon here in the 50s for some reason or another. The year I opened the store was 1960, mm -hmm. and the whole fleet, the whole Pacific fleet, the Albacore fleet, was all outside of Moore Bay, the Albacore. In one time, there was 362 boats here in the harbor. I have pictures of that somewhere. It was, they were just rafted. I mean, uh, I had 30, 40, 50, 60 people waiting to be waited on, you know. And here I was just starting the business and truckloads of stuff would be coming in. The fishermen would jump in, unload the truck, pack up their stuff, ride up their own slips. I couldn't wait on them, there were so many. And uh, it, was, it was just uh, unbelievable what happened. And Albacore uh, in those years were pretty close into the beach, weren't they? Yes, they were. Uh, normally, I mean, Albacore's always been, our mainstay of Albacore has been 40 to 80 miles, 25 miles, and even 20 miles to, uh, later as the water's warmed up in the later years. In Newport, for example, we'd go from 20 to 60, 80 miles offshore. And the same thing happened along the coast here. In fact, it's strange, and I think about myself quite often, when I began shark fishing and I left Newport, which was a mainstay, Newport and Coos Bay, we considered the end of the albacore, the end of the salmon. But I was coming down, I was at Point Arena, and it was beautiful blue water, and it was, uh, and I thought, golly, I would just wonder what's here, you know? So I told the guys, I put out a couple of albacore jigs, let's see if there's any fish here. And sure enough, we put out three lines and they were loaded with beautiful, we got a ton of albacore. I couldn't believe it. I got on the radio and I told the guys up north, I said, look, there's albacore down here, boys. And as we kept coming down to San Francisco, Santa Cruz, and, and even off of San Simeon, I saw a thing that I'll never forget in my life when I was off of San Simeon, was about 30 miles offshore. There was, a, I bet you, 100 million whale birds. Whale birds. You couldn't even go through them, you know, because, you know, it would slow down because there were so many of them that they couldn't even get out of your way. They were full. The sky was black and the ocean was black with them. You know, I mean, it was just an incredible sight. Incredible. I mean, I've seen things in, in my lifetime that, you know, you don't even dream about anymore because mm -hmm. it was all new. It was virgin. And uh, Moore Bay was new, it was virgin. Uh, yes, there was no albacore uh, uh, fishing here either then, and there was no salmon. Although probably, you know, in San Diego and places down further south, there was some albacore fishing off of Mexico and the Guadalupe Islands and things like that. But uh, there's, there's a whole revelation of... I think albacore right now is probably the mainstay of the 
fishing fleet. Mm -hmm. I think uh, trawling is, the limits are so restricted to the commercial fishermen that there just isn't hardly a living in it anymore. Albacore is still pretty much wide open. Yeah, Albacore is still pretty much wide open, and uh, it's still a pretty viable fisheries yet. I think guys can get out and get, you know, a few tons of Albacore and maybe survive. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, these big boats are three, four, five hundred thousand dollars and big insurances to pay and things. They're, they're going to have a struggle in their hands. I recall seeing of boats back in the uh, era, of, well, as far back as the 30s, little Monterey's that were fishing albacore. Right. Um, so that would indicate to me that he had fish fairly close to shore. Very close. Well, that's another thing that brings a point to me. We were coming down, and we were about 15 miles off of San Simeon. And we see this little Monterey boat, and we go by it, and the guy was just panicky. You know, this little Italian fisherman from Monterey, and he was just panic stricken, and totally panicky. And I, I walked up to him and I could understand Italian. I said, what's the matter? Dio mio, my gosh. You know, he was saying, I broke down. And I said, well, where did you come from? San Simeon, please, San Simeon, you know. I said, okay. So in Italian, I finally got out of him what he wanted to go. So I, we tied on line on to him and we towed him into San Simeon. And here was a Van Camp buying barge, which was maybe 120 feet long, and maybe 40 or 50 little albacore boats. And as far out as they went was 15, 18 miles. I mean, not even that far. They would go 8 to 10 miles offshore. So there was albacore here then, too. And uh, it was fascinating. I mean, and I went on board the boat, and uh, the buying barge, and the fellow that was running was uh, Tex Ellington. And he later got to be a big wheel for Van Camp Seafoods, and we remained friends all that time. So every time I went into Van Camps in San Pedro to unload albacore, we'd always have a confab, you know. And uh, that was just really something to see that. It was a sight. Was the uh, barge used for any kind of processing? No, just strictly buying and refrigerating. That refrigeration. Yes, they had sharp freeze refrigeration, and they had bait for the boats and gasoline and supplies, you know, to take care of the little boats. Oh, okay. And, and was it towed then to, to Los Angeles to, for products? Yes, it was towed up and towed back, right. Oh, yeah. what, what size of a vessel was it? It was a barge about 120, 30 feet long, yeah, a big barge, and, uh, and they had a lot of supplies, a lot of equipment on board, and it was, we could even tie up to it, and we were 65 feet, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite a thing, you know. Yeah. And, um, Let's see. Under normal circumstances, where would you, say if you were fishing albacore, where would you land your fish? Would you bring them into Morro Bay? Yes, we into Morro Bay, right. The early years, though, I didn't fish albacore at all until 1952, because I was shark fishing, and in 1952, uh, the shark market went uh, bad because they synthesized the, the vitamin A, so there was no more shark market at all. The price dropped from, say, 10 to eleven, twelve dollars a pound, down to fifty, seventy-five cents. So that ended up that business, and uh, that was all over. So, were you fishing mm -hmm. sharks all through World War II? Um, well, it's from nineteen forty to uh, forty-six to fifty-two. Yes, I was fishing sharks. And that was primarily for the uh, vitamin A. Which vitamin A. For enhance night vision and pilots? Yes, right. Night vision for pilots. The government used it extensively then. Mm -hmm. The pilots would take vitamin A pills, I guess, to increase their vision. and At least that's what we were told anyway. And so we had high priorities for that. So, so was, that, in a way, constituted your service to the country during the In a way, <laughs> yeah. In a good way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned that there was quite a large abalone fleet here, and, and uh, which was still in operation in 1960. Uh, tell me how you supported the abalone fleet. We supported the abalone fleet really by making equipment for them. We'd make the tanks, uh, the air tanks, the compressors. We'd have always four or five units ready to go in case you know one broke down or froze up or something, and we'd have air hoses for the divers and masks that they used, uh, hookah masks, they'd call them. Uh, there, was very, there was only two 
people that were using regular Navy diving gear here. A fellow by the name of Lanky Timpton and uh, one of the Pierces was using heavy uh, diving equipment, but all the rest of the fellows were using what they call hookah gear. And, uh, and that, that was kind of a transition period from the heavy gear, the, the Navy dress, to um, the swim gear. Uh, did you sell wetsuits as well, or dry suits? Oh yes, we did, yeah. Not, not wetsuits, really, uh, because they, uh, it was mostly dry suits that they used, the fishermen. Uh, and uh, they uh, they used a lot of stuff. I mean, it was a it was a good business for the from the start. And we helped the fishermen, and the, we gave them credit and helped them. You know, there was always uh, <laughs> put things on credit, but uh, ninety percent of them always paid their bills and uh, and stuff. There was several processing plants here. Then Abalone, there was at least one, two, three, four processing plants, then they were going all day long, you know, and processing abalone. One behind the store, Pierce had an abalone plant, and then uh, Frank Breb had an abalone plant, and uh, there was, I think, one more, you know, and hauled tons of abalone. We could buy a five-pound can, uh, 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 thing of abalone for uh, $3.50. A five-pound box. Five-pound box of abalone. Three dollars and fifty. Yeah, seventy cents a pound. <laughs> yeah, think about that. Mm -hmm. And these were beautiful, grade A. You know, the thick three-eighths inch of steaks. Beautiful. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was. Well, you know, besides the, the uh, forty to fifty boats, and you also had all the support people, the the tenders, the the skippers, the. You know, the processing. There, there was a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. It, it it was quite an industry here then. It supplied a lot of people. It, uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, I think each individual vessel supplies about, uh, there's 10 different businesses or 11 that are dependent on the fishing boat. Uh, you take the shipyards, the mechanics, the suppliers, the grocery stores, uh, and you start ending it up. There's quite a... <coughs> Excuse me. The boats are always uh, expensive to maintain. I mean, they just don't. Uh, you want some water? Yeah. Oh. <coughs> we'll stop for a guys, but there was one guy who was a constant, uh, a constable. Rudy, uh, his name was Rudy Sill. Big bruiser, you know. I mean, he must have weighed 250 pounds, and he was all man. And every once in a while, it'd be a big fight down there in Happy Jacks, and he'd go down there. He'd grab two of them and bat their heads together. Get a old man, you know. And nobody. <laughs> Fool around with that guy. They respected him. Yeah. I mean, there was, you know, it was not like today that if you touch somebody, you go to jail, you know, a policeman <laughs> even. But he'd go in there and he'd take the law in his own hands and he kept that thing straight. It was a rough bunch. It was a, oh, they were a rough bunch, My boy. Dad skipper for the Black Fleet in Clancy. And yeah. It was another part. Yeah. Do you mind telling a certain one of those stories on no. camera? No. Okay. All right. I think I'm. We're rolling. We covered. Oh, okay. Fine. Oh, so you got that? Yeah. Oh, oh you got well, that? Part of it, I came Fire. in if you wanted to re-roll okay. it. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Uh, abalone divers could be a pretty rough crowd. So, and uh, I remember Happy Jacks and Circle Inn were their yeah. hangouts. Uh, what can you tell us about those two establishments? Uh, who? Oh, about Happy Jacks and. Oh. <laughs> Well, that was the meeting place for the abalone divers. You know, I think abalone divers was a, it was a very rough business. I mean, uh, uh, very hard and very... I remember I used to see Lanky Tipton come in with heavy gear, and he'd be just dragged out, you know. And, and a lot of these uh, abalone divers, not all of them, but uh, quite a few of them, the Pierce's, the Montgomery's, they, when they come in, they were making maybe $150, $200, you know, a day. That was big money in those days. And they go into Happy Jacks and <laughs> get gowned up a little bit, and boy, there'd be some pretty good fights out there once in a while. And uh, yeah, it was a pretty rowdy bunch. Happy Jacks and the Circle Inn were the meeting places for them, you know. And there was the gals there to meet them too, and, and all that. And it was it was it was quite a time. There's always been a few women involved in, in abalone diving as well. But was that true in the back in the 50s and 60s? Uh, not that I recall. I don't recall any woman being a diver, actually. There may have been one or two that were tenders uh, on boats, but not that I recall any women diving, actually, for abalone in, in the years that I was there, at least in the store. 
And, and do you recall the, the various processors that were here at the time? Oh, gee. Yeah. That were here? Yes. And then uh, the, the various support industries that were, uh, we kind of got into that when I started coughing. But, um, you know, I think we did mention that, didn't we? The, well, we you started to say there were 10 to 11 businesses. Yeah, dependent upon the, the, those, if you, if you want to list those and give us an idea what kind of jobs that were created in at that time based on the fishing. Oh, yeah. I, I was try, I'm just offhand here. Uh, I'm trying to remember at that time what we were talking about and the value of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, the industry itself at that time, just the abalone industry. Um, I remember I gave an interview on that, and it seemed to me like it was in the several a million dollars or more that was the, you know the brought was brought into the uh, into the harbor because it was a pretty good industry. There was you know each plant had ten twelve people working, and then the boats all had two men to work, you know, a tender and a diver, and sometimes uh, uh, then there was a marine store myself, and I had two or three people working for me. The shipyards uh, that were going, uh, the grocers, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> insurance and, on boats and people. And I mean, there's, uh, like I said, there was about 10 or 11. I can't quite name them all right now, but uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite a hefty thing. People don't realize how much it means. And now you can see with the fishing fleet gone that the harbor of the city is suffering. I mean, uh, yes, tourism is going to take over, but but uh, you still have to have the other part of it. And I think areas like up in Oregon and different places where you know, they were dependent upon fishing and logging are destitute now mm -hmm. because those two industries were the backbone, uh, the lifeline of a city. And, and uh, where there's nothing else, fortunately here, we still can depend on tourism as long as times remain fairly good. But the fishing industry itself was the backbone. It was always there. There was always boats that were being maintained, people that had to buy and support their families and, and uh, schools and taxes and homes to take care of. I mean, you look at all these things and uh, pretty soon they begin to add up. And like I said, I think on an interview that I had sometime in the 60s for the Albuquerque fleet, we estimate there was over a million dollars that was uh, brought into the uh, city, uh, we weren't uh, city then, we were unincorporated. Uh, we incorporated actually in 1964. Mm -hmm. And I felt that we had a lot of wealth here and I called a meeting and got 15, 16 people together and, and we started the incorporation move. And it was two years and, and we had PG&E here and I said, look, we're sending all this money to the county boys, let's wake up. Mm -hmm. And we finally did. And, uh, they had two attempts before that, but uh, they completely failed. The people weren't ready for it. In fact, when we did incorporate, uh, started the incorporation move, there was a lot of angry old timers here that didn't want any part of it. And, uh, but again, we had this enormous wealth. Of, uh, we were 6,000 people and we had a $58 million assessed valuation. I said, why well, pass all this wealth up and give it to the county? They're not giving us anything back in return. Who, who were some of the other founders of uh, the city of Morro Bay? Uh, well, I started to move. There was Harold Pierpoint. Uh, God, I can't think of the name. Uh, Fred Witt was another one. Uh, Vernon Crass was another one. Um, um, uh, Judge Fred Shank was uh, in there. Uh, like I say, I, I, I picked out about 15 people. Um, I can't remember all the rest of them now. Some of them were from, Bay, from North Moore Bay that were quite active and good people. We needed a nucleus of people. We had to raise $1,500 to get a feasibility study. And we, put, we chipped that in ourselves and, and got the feasibility study on it. And, uh, and it finally took off. It was a pretty hard fought battle. And uh, you know, you think about 1964, and well, we actually started two years it took to, to get the whole thing rolling. It was. Do I recall correctly you served as mayor? I served as mayor the second time around. The first election I didn't run, the second election I did, but uh, my term was short lived. <laughs> what, what years did you serve as mayor? 66. Six, one yeah. year, 66. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we incorporated in 64, there was an election, and then two members came up and 
Fred Donahue, one of the other fellows and myself, ran for the council, and we were embroiled in all kinds of lawsuits, and, and I was bitter about it, and we went in and got that straightened out, and I think I served. And then I was too controversial anyway. I, I, I'm not a politician, you know, and I, I just didn't get along with the politics, and I served uh, about a year, and then I just said, it's enough. <laughs> you weren't a career politician. No. No, <laughs> no. A good example. You know, I can't. I know the politics has to be give and take, but I had principles of my own, and I didn't feel that there's certain things I wanted to to give up, mm -hmm. and uh, I gave up politics instead. Well, we kind of got away from fishing, but this is an interesting, <laughs> you know, part of your life. Yeah. Uh, you were also in the newspaper business. Yes. Can you tell us about the newspaper? Well, uh, the, my bookkeeper, Ralph Gunther, I'll mention his name, wanted to go in the newspaper business, and uh, he asked me if I'd go in with partnership with him, and I didn't really want to. I had all the work I could take care of, but he insisted, and I finally thought, well, okay, fine. And we started the newspaper, and it, it, it was a disaster, really, you know, trying to stay afloat. And uh, after Ralph got out of it, I took it over, and, and I don't want to go into the other details on it, but uh, we got, uh, I, I worked at it for about eight, ten months, and uh, I was losing money every month. And uh, finally, Emmons Blake came over from Blake Penry, and he said, I got a buyer for your newspaper. And I said, really? There's several fellows wanted to buy it, and, but no one had any money. I said, uh, well, who is it? He says, you'll be surprised. So I said, okay. So he said, let's go down to San Diego. And I had no idea where we were going. Yeah. And uh, so we went down there, and here was the Scripps people, <laughs> Paul Scripps and his father and the lawyer and everybody else. And they told me what, asked me what I wanted for it, and right. we shook hands on the deal. Mm -hmm. And this is strange. The same day that I made the deal with uh, Scripps, a guy called me that had been dickering with me to buy and offered me $30,000 more then I sold it to Scripps for it. Their lawyers insisted that I sign a contract, and I said, no, I said, a handshake is good enough. He said, we don't buy on handshakes. I said, well, I do. And uh, I sold the paper to Scripps. I told the guy, I said, you're too late, I made a deal. And he said, is it, uh, did you sign a contract? I said, no, but I shook hands. And uh, that's how the deal went, you know. That, that was the Morbay Sun. That was the Morbay Sun. And then the Scripps people bought out the bulletin, and so they called it the Sun Bulletin. And of course, here a couple of years ago, Scripps sold out to uh, Knight Ritter. Yeah. So. Now they are on uh, Market Street next to your uh, yes. service equipment. Is that uh, a building that you constructed as well? Or no, I didn't construct that. I own I own that building, and uh, they wanted to buy it or lease it, and I sold it. Oh, unfortunately, uh -huh. yeah, that time property wasn't worth very much. You know, it was a Things lot. Have changed in the real estate market. Yeah, it'd be ten times more than what I sold it for. <laughs> but you did well. Yeah, I did well. Yeah, I was I was happy to get out from under. I I would have liked the newspaper business, but I couldn't take care of two businesses at one time. It it just drained me too much. And, and what years were were those, John? Pardon? The, the newspaper. Uh, the newspaper business. Let's see. They bought it in. 71, I believe, 1971. Mm -hmm. So right before you retired then? Yeah, and I sold it to my son in 72. Mm -hmm. Right, they bought in 71. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the ethnic background in the fishing fleet here. You mentioned uh, when you first arrived the Italian fishermen. Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? On which fishermen? Uh, Italian fishermen. Oh, well, there's uh, ethnics involved in every harbor, actually. If you take Seattle, they're Norwegians, mostly. Uh, you take Astoria, and there's mostly Finns. Uh, you take, uh, you come down Newport, and you have a mixture. More, there's not really anything much there. Eureka's the same way. Then you come down to uh, San Francisco, and San Francisco is mostly Italian fishermen. And uh, then you go down to San Pedro and you find Slavs and, uh, and um, Portuguese and, and the same thing in San Diego. 
So, you know, I mean, it seems like everyone picked their area, and I don't know why, because I think the northern climate is conducive to fishermen from the more northern latitudes in the, in the Atlantic Ocean and uh, things like that. So there is a diversity of uh, fishermen in every port, almost, but not anymore. I think that's pretty well changed, uh, I think, throughout the years, although still a lot of it exists. And, uh, but there's a lot of new faces now. The old timers my age, and I'm coming up on 86, are, are gone. I mean, I look back and I knew them all, and, and now I go into a harbor and I don't know anyone anymore, you know, except some of the people that used to deal with me in the store. But the old timers are not there anymore, they're gone. You, you mentioned uh, the, what we all call the lack of, of regulation when you started. Uh, did that help people to transfer their business uh, to the next generation, to their, their sons and other family members? Well, sure, you could, you could, uh, you mean in the fishing industry? In the fishing industry. Oh, yes, because there was no regulations. Or you could do anything that you felt that you wanted to do. You could move laterally in any direction, mm -hmm. and there was no, no restrictions, no, no permits required. Uh, now every industry is uh, a permit except albacore and i don't know how soon they're going to get that under control and the government controls it all now you know i mean through through uh permits through regulations and different things and uh, at that time there was none it was survival of the fittest may i ask a question <clears throat> in the um transition from open fishing to permits what period of time did that occur and what was that like for the fishermen? Uh, the period of time, I would say it started in the uh, latter part of 70s, mid 70s, 80s. They started issuing permits and, uh, and uh, quotas uh, began too as the fishing sort of started to decline. They started, began setting in quotas and and then Senator Warren Magnuson set up the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. That's what began, and I don't recall when that was, but probably in, around 25 years ago, maybe, the fishermen from the... Uh, early 70s. Yeah, yeah, early 70s, yeah. 76, I think. Right, yeah. yeah, right in there. I served on that for a year, too. And uh, it was it was quite interesting. You served on the, the Pacific Council? Itself. Fisheries Management Council, right. And uh, it was a it was an appointment by the governor, but uh, then they began to cut costs and this and that. And they let Travis Evans was also on it too. We, he and I both joined at the same time, and then they eliminated both of us. And how, well, how do you feel about this regulatory process? Has it, it made things better? Has it made things worse? What What do you think? Well, the regulatory process, I guess, has to be. Uh, you have to cut down the fishing fleet. I mean, there's no question in my mind about that. Um, the, the problem is that our fisheries grounds are limited. You know, you can only go so far. And every boat that traverses the same grounds eventually depletes those grounds. If you had 100 miles to go out, that would be fine, but you don't have that. And that's why the fishing fleet is concentrated all in one, you know, in one area of the Pacific Ocean here. And uh, the other part that's, of course, been, been a demise for the fishing industry has been uh, the advent of the uh, sophisticated the electronics that's come out. You know, we have sounders, we have uh, plotters now, where if you catch a good fish, you, you set it on the plotter and you can go right back on that same exact course, you know, and you can set eight different courses. I mean, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Sonars that you can see everything. Uh, uh, color sounders, it, uh, it's, it's uh, radar, GPS. If you find a location, get it, plot the GPS in, and or before the GPS was Lorenz, and, uh, and the fish don't have a chance anymore to survive. And not only that, but the fishermen have been more sophisticated uh, in building nets. Now they've got nets with huge rollers where they would go over rocks and different things, where it's a habitat for the fishermen. And, and once you take his habitat away, I mean, you ruin that, fisher, that fishery's life. And you take like uh, uh, red rock cod, you know, they have a home, like you and I have a home. 
and they live within a certain periphery of that area. And, uh, and, and they live maybe, what, 30, 35 years, you know, and once you wipe out, wipe out the breeding stock, uh, it's, it's just uh, too bad. I mean, I, I just felt all along, you know, that the government was in the wrong side of supporting all these big fishing boats. I, I really believe that way back. Tell, tell us about how the Magnuson Act and government loans helped to change the, those dynamics. Well, it was just that the government began loaning money. Uh, I'm not sure if the Magnuson Act was the, uh, the part that uh, was responsible for the loans. Uh, the Magnuson Act, I think, was more to, to, to try to conserve fisheries and find out what was happening to the fishing industry. And there was many, many people appointed that uh, I didn't approve of. And uh, really nothing got done on the year that I was there, very little, because you had people that represented the, the, the uh, buyers and they had a, an, an interest, you know, in seeing to it that nothing was done. Then you had the fisherman who naturally was prejudiced to protect his own business too, and, uh, and all that. It was, it was just a mishmash of, of too many different people with too many different ideas, and you could argue all day long, and you'd end up at night, and nothing was accomplished really. And, uh, and I, I don't know how you could really get down to doing it, because the scientists and the and have different views, a fisherman has his views, a processor has his views, and, and all in all, how you meet these uh, things is uh, very, very difficult. Uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, really. Uh, you have to listen to all sides of the, and I think they should be advisors more than anything else. Uh, uh, the fishing industry should have its people that are advising. The scientists, the biologists should have their people that give their input into it. And, and then there has to be a consensus on what can we best do for the industry. Because you know yourself, the fisherman's got 400000 invested in a boat, and he doesn't want to lose that boat. The canners, you know, and the fish processors have millions of dollars invested in cannery equipment. They don't want to lose that. Then comes along the scientists and the biologists who know what they read in the book, but they don't really have the hardcore experience that the actual fisherman has. He's the one that knows what's going on in his industry. Yes. And he has to be honest and come forth, you know, and give it straight so that no one side gets carried away. And that is one of the things that's hard to come by. It, it's one of the things I found difficult when I served on the council to, uh, to come to any consensus on it. Just, you know, I mean, it was just devastating. And then you had the sport fishing people on that too, and they didn't like the commercial fishermen, and uh, so there was always a conflict there. And that's why I got actually, you know, they got after me because I went in as a sport fisherman actually, which I'd been doing for 15 years. And oh, you're a commercial guy, you know, but I was trying to be fair on both sides. I mean, whether it's sport or commercial, we're all in the same boat together, fellows, you know. But uh, they didn't see it that way, and they wrote letters <laughs> and. Uh, I guess eventually they eliminated my job, and they also eliminated Travis Evans, too, and several others. Now this, the commission is limited down. I mean, their funds started running down, and so they cut down a lot, a great deal. So what do you think would, would improve the function of the council? I think the function of the council, how could it be improved? I don't know really how you could improve it. Uh, it. When you start dealing with government bureaucracies and, and emotions and people, it becomes a most difficult task because everybody gets carried away with their own little problem, you know, and no one sits down and looks at the really offshore or picture. Uh, the, the sports fisherman, he wants to keep it off for himself and say, well, the, the commercial guys are ruining our fishing grounds, which really is not a fact. Uh, so, you know, you have all these little idiosyncrasies going on all the time, and in the end, everybody suffers because nothing really gets done. And that's what I noticed in about a year, that very, very little actually was accomplished. If you start doing something about the salmon up north, the Indians came in, mm -hmm. and they raised cane with everything, you know what I mean, because you're taking their rights away from them, you know, so. Uh, do, do you think that and it's uh, the objective of being fair that the council is ineffective then? Is it ineffective? Yeah, because it's, 
ultimately trying to be fair to every party. Yeah. And by doing so, you, you it, never have consensus. Yeah. It, it, nothing ever happens, really, to, to, to really get down to it. The fishermen are quite bitter now because they figure they've been hurt the most, mm -hmm. and probably they have. You know, I mean, there's no doubt about it. But eventually, if we look at it objectively, I mean, there has to be a buyout of some fishing boats. I mean, there's no question in my mind that half of the trawlers have to be purchased out. You think we're overcapitalized? Oh, over sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I feel badly that the government put these people in the condition that they are now by loaning, making all these loans, and then saying, well, sorry, but you can't fish. Yes. Well, you know, if they did it, they should be yeah, held responsible a little bit. Do you know the source of the loans? The source of loans were banks, you know, they, they, with backed up money. Uh, PCA, uh, which was a, uh, uh, the uh, Farmers Productive Association, make, uh, made a lot of loans, mm -hmm. but they were all loans that were backed up by the government. Oh, okay. So they didn't lose any money. The government backed their loans up, and the banks did. And they also, the, the government made loans directly, too. Yeah. Do you know how many vessels we're talking about in the Pacific Fleet? Oh, gosh, I don't know. You, you mean trawl vessels? Yeah. yeah. God, I don't know, really. I, I, I had a figure in my mind one time, but I can't really remember. But it's a great number. Yeah. It's a great number. It's a big problem. Oh, it's a huge problem. Absolutely. How, how about another uh, one of these agencies, the uh, Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission? Have you ever had uh, involvement with them? Which who? It's called the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. I've never had any involvement with okay. it. No. It's, it's uh, California, Oregon, Washington, uh -huh. Idaho. And, uh, it's, it's an arm of the, of the Congress. Mm -hmm. I'll be done. No. Except about the last 12, 15 years, I've actually just laid pretty low. I just haven't really been very active in it. Okay. <laughs> I did my share and, and says enough is enough. You know, <laughs> Let the young fellows take over. It's what my doctor told me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you feel about the subject of uh, transferable quotas as a, a mechanism to reduce the, the fleet size? Well, the trouble with transferable quotas is that the quotas are all being purchased by large corporations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a man's got a 60-foot boat, he sells his quota to, a, to, a, to someone else that's bigger, and pretty soon the big guy ends up mm -hmm. getting all the quotas. And it's all right, I guess, but uh, it'll all be controlled. The same thing as fishing permits. When the trawl permits came in, the guys were getting up to $4,000 per, per foot on trawl permits, you know. So it, bigger boats were buying them from Seattle. They were building big boats and didn't have them. So they were buying all these trawl permits, you know, and, and getting big boats into the business, you know. So, you know, now the trawl permit market is down. and. Uh, the salmon, uh, 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 not permits, but uh, up in Bering Sea uh, are down to, to about a third of what they used to be because the salmon price has gone to pot again. Yeah. Uh, aquaculture a cause of, of that competition? Aquaculture, it would be a cause in uh, salmon fisheries, yes, uh, absolutely. I think that's that is going to ruin the salmon fishing industry. Not to the point that it's going to be totally out, but it's, uh, it's going to have an effect on the price that the fishermen get for salmon, no doubt about it. Chile is now a major producer. Norway was a big producer of, of farmed salmon. Now Chile is almost up to, to, uh, to Norway, you know, and uh, Canada and all these countries, and the East Coast, everybody is farming salmon, and, and that's... Uh, or when you can buy salmon steaks for 360 a pound on specials, I mean, you know, that's going to hurt the price of the commercial. Well, last year the price was way, way down, dollar and a half, dollar twenty-five, dollar seventy-five, and that's no price for no. for fish, salmon, you know, wild ocean salmon, no price. And we, we seem to have a pretty healthy salmon stock here. King salmon seem to be doing very well. Do you think that Morro Bay will continue to be an important salmon port? Well, it's pretty hard to say about salmon. Uh, they're very elusive. Uh, you can catch them one year and then miss them the next. It depends on water, the conditions of the, the ocean, uh, the feed that's uh, in the ocean, and, and that varies from year to year. 
I've seen years when we never sold ten dollars worth of fishing salmon fishing gear, mm -hmm. and then again this year, from all the reports I'm able to gather, the salmon fishing is looking uh, very very good, mm -hmm. and there's fish down as far as Santa Barbara and even further down the line from Santa Barbara. So. Uh, it, it, it may be a good season here. In fact, everybody's looking forward to a good season. Uh, you seem to support uh, the idea of, of no-take zones, that maybe some areas should be set aside uh, to protect fish stocks. Is, is, is that correct? Yeah, they are doing that, and they're going to be doing that uh, more and more, I think, uh, setting aside. They're just beginning that program. But, well, I'll tell you, it, it, uh, it's a rough, rough situation we're facing right now, very serious stuff. And I, I can't see, uh, you know, the hard thing would be, you know, to just really do it right, but uh, it's, again, you have people's lives, their fortunes, their families, and everything involved, and, and you know, you want to make a hard decision, and yet you're going to knock somebody in the head and knock them out, you know, I mean, you got to think about that. Uh, how you're going to do it, and preserve the thing is, uh, I just haven't delved into it that deep yet, but, but it is a really major, major, major problem that we're facing, no doubt in my mind about it. How about uh, marine sanctuaries? How do you feel about them? About what? Marine sanctuaries? How marine do you feel about marine well, I, I'm not favorable to a marine sanctuary because I don't think we need it, number one. And I was listening one day to a fellow who talking about the marine sanctuary in Florida, and he said it was a disaster, you know. So I, I'm not really favorable for it, neither the fishermen, because I don't think it's doing what, what they want to do with it, and that is eventually to just knock it, all the fishermen out of the area, you know, and that's what's going to happen. Once they get their foot in the door, then, sorry, boys, it's here, you know, and uh, what are you going to do about it? Um, change the subject a little bit. Uh, you were involved in salvaging uh, an ocean-going tug at one time. Oh, the Blue Eagle. The Blue Eagle. <laughs> yeah. And that was what uh, the early '70s. And right. '72 maybe. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us about the Blue Eagle? Well, the Blue Eagle was a large tug, uh, 100 foot tug, 110 foot. I'm not sure. And it was coming across the bar, and it was a big swell. And at that time, the Corps of Engineers dredged the harbor, and they dredged the tailings right at the mouth of the harbor, which wasn't very smart. And so the sandbank built up, and it would break very easily. Well, these people didn't know that. And they came across the barn, they took a little breaker, and the thing was kind of top-heavy, and she rolled over, and the mast was sticking above. Well, my only involvement was financially. Your, your interest in salvaging the, the Blue Eagle was a Yeah, I, I furnished the money, and Carson Porter and his father, uh, they raised it with balloons and floats and, and stuff. It was really an accomplishment that was unbelievable. We had uh, salvage experts come from Seattle and San Francisco to find out how a bunch of little city boys did this, you know. And uh, they were amazed that we could raise that tug and uh, float it. And, uh, they, they were involved in it, and then I think they turned around and sold it, uh, cleaned it all up and sold it. And so you, you recouped your investment? I recouped my investment, yeah. Did you make a little on top? Uh, a little bit, yeah. yeah, a little bit. It could have been a total disaster, too. I could have lost it all. I think I invested something like $16,000 uh, in it, and uh, well, that was a big gamble. Substantial amount. Yeah, a substantial amount, sure. Because... Uh, Everybody would, couldn't believe that it could be done. The first thing they did, we went to uh, Sacramento, we bought some 500-pound um, rubber tanks and attached half-inch chain onto it, you know, and then they blew the tanks up. Believe it or not, that chain broke loose and those tanks all popped out 20 feet up in the air, you know, just from the pressure of, of the, you wouldn't think they could do that. But those floats uh, did the job, we did it differently. And, and uh, stuff, and it, it finally, it finally just floated right up, and we towed her in, and they pumped her out, and that was it. Well, what did you use as a, a support vessel for a dive platform? Uh, just Carson Porter's little dive boat. That's all? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> that was all, and they went down there, I think it was two of them, went down there with air, I think they had bigger air compressors, and just started pumping air, and 
those things. I mean, it's just unbelievable, really, that, that it happened, but it did. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would have cost probably a couple million dollars to raise that thing and move it. If they'd have sent uh, divers and equipment down from San Francisco, it would have been a fortune. Now, what would have happened if, if you had failed and, and they had failed? What, what would have happened to that vessel? Well, they'd have to send uh, outfits down to do it, salvage companies to do it. There's outfits that specialize in that in L.A., San Francisco, and, and uh, I made the arrangements with the insurance companies, and, and we didn't sign any agreement that we, we'd it'd be held liable only in the event that uh, anyone was hurt. You know, we uh, indemnified any, anyone being hurt crew-wise uh, that was furnishing help on the, on the thing. Other than that, uh, if we failed, that was uh, just one of those things. We couldn't guarantee that we could lift it, but uh, but uh, Carson and his dad did it, you know. There was, and I think they had a couple other young people helping too, because they had to pump a lot of air, you know, and then fill the gas tanks, uh, fuel tanks full of air, and plug those up, and <laughs> yeah, it was it was really remarkable. Just They're very to, clever. Very clever, yeah. absolutely. We've all seen some of the jade boulders they float. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. incredible. Yeah. Uh, when you salvage a ship like that, what kind of rights do you have to it, or do you have any? Well, you had all the rights. Had all the rights. Yeah, the company assigned the rights to the ship mm -hmm. if we salvaged it. Yeah. yeah, that was one of the things we insisted on, and uh, and they were very very happy to do it too, because they knew what it would cost to get that thing out of there, and uh, they so that was your vessel for a while. Yeah, Carson and his father took it over. And they cleaned it all up and started the engines up in it and cleaned all the fuel tanks and and they finally got it going. So yeah, yeah it ran on its own power. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing it. <laughs> Didn't you see it? I oh did. yeah. Yeah. Quite a sight, yeah, wasn't it? Was, it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. I have a picture of it there. <laughs> Let's see. Um that's a good break. I gotta change to take a break. Okay. We only got a couple more awesome. things. Anything that you want stoned out, killed four people in the car, and himself. Uh, no, he didn't kill himself, no. But anyway, Matson was sued for millions of dollars. And they say, hey, wait a minute, this guy was on his vacation. He's, he's off now. But technically, he wasn't off. He was still an employee of Matson Steamship Line, and they got stuck. The court, the Supreme Court held it up. He's still an employee under the Jones Act. Uh, they had to pay off the debt. And uh, that's that's part of the dangers of a fishing boat. It's uh, it's very hazardous. Up the uh, trawling industry, uh, the fishing industry is the most dangerous occupation in the world. Each year, twenty four thousand fishermen die around the world. That's seventy fishermen per day around the world that die from fishing. That's quite a large number. You know, it's staggering. I read that and I said, gee, it can't be, you know, but uh, it's, those are statistics that uh, has been gathered, you know. That's incredible. It's, it's hard to believe, isn't it? it is. And that's why a fishing boat, it has a crew, like with the trawler, they have to have at least two men and uh, they have to cover those men and that's what gets expensive. And then you take a boat that's insured for 300000 or whatever, uh, you're taking, I don't know what the rates are because that's really not my business, but I do the surveys, and that runs maybe 4%, $12,000, depending on the age of the boat. And then you've got the two crew members, and they're probably 4000 apiece, 3800 to 4200 That's 8000 And so, you know, and that's for small boats. Some of those purseiners up there that I surveyed in, in Monterey it has seven men, five men, you know. And think of what those insurance bills are, and they're big boats, 80, 90 footers. Worth uh, one million seven eight hundred thousand dollars, and and you start insuring one of those, and it's a big sum of money. And now, uh, like for instance, two years ago, the squid industry was excellent. Some of the boats grossed as high as nine hundred thousand to a million dollars. Now, last year, the year Jody built his new boat, the market just there was no more squid; they disappeared down there in the channel, and no one made anything. This last year was pretty good, but the price dropped to nothing. The market's way down. From 500 a ton, it's down to $100 a ton, and they're on limits. So you see how this business fluctuates, you know. Very dynamic. 
it's just it's very dynamic. You just don't know. You you can't predict from one year to the next. And yet, fuel is expensive. You know, when I started fishing, fuel was six cents a gallon for diesel, and now it's a dollar. Well, I don't know what it costs here, but a dollar forty, fifty cents a gallon for a gallon of fuel. And you take a boat that hauls 10, 15,000 gallons of fuel, look at, you know, <laughs> how much that costs, you know. Everything is so expensive. Shipyard labor, $60, $70 an hour, and it, it's just prohibitive. And you can't neglect a boat. You've got to do the work. You've got to take care of that boat, or pretty soon you end up with a piece of scrap. They gotta be hauled out, they gotta be painted, the engines have to be maintained. Uh, it's, it's just an ongoing expense that never eases up. It, uh, it's, it's, it's a hazardous occupation and an expensive occupation. Well, these are all individual small businesses, too. Yes, they are, absolutely. So when you have high fixed costs like that, and yeah. you're, you have these market fluctuations in, in price of fish. Right. Sure. Because um, you never know from one year to the next. We're predicting a lot of salmon here. but. Who knows what the salmon's going to do, actually? We really don't know. It could be good, and then the price is shot. Just like I was talking to a Monterey buyer up there. He uh, buys sardines. And uh, he, he said, you know, the squid market right now, there's little tiny squid in the Channel Islands, but they're three, four inches long, and there's no market for them. You can fish them, but China is the only place they can sell them. And he said they won't pay anything for them. So what are you going to do? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. You, you mentioned sardine, which I think a lot of people probably don't realize has, has recovered to quite a uh, large fishery again, 50,000 oh. tons, I believe. Oh, yeah. It's, well, sardine was a major industry here. Even here in Moore Bay, we had lots of sardines when I was fishing myself. Mm -hmm. There were sardines that uh, they had two, two fish buyers with the elevators to buy the sardines, the first saners were down here. Sometimes 10, 15 saners would be down here unloading sardines. That was another okay. industry that, uh, that's gone, mm -hmm. that I never even thought about. Yeah. You know, a lot of things enter your mind that you don't remember, but they had elevators to take sardines, and uh, one year we had uh, albacore, that one year when I tell you a big albacore season, we had probably four or 5,000 tons of albacore came in here. Imagine 360 boats in this harbor, That's you know, at one time. <laughs> Weather blew up and everybody would come in. And I sold, uh, and we had a little five-inch Sonys, you know, 12 volts, you know, the World Series games were going on. I sold 150 of those little five-inch Sonys to the fishermen <laughs> for the ball game, you know. So you the ball. Yeah, mm -hmm. we were getting at that time 350, 385 a ton. And now it's uh, 16, 1700 a ton, you know, but... Uh, it has not really kept up with inflation. No, yeah. no. I, I look at it as a, a tremendous bargain. You know, I buy oh. two, up to 400 pounds of fish a year. Sure. And it's, it's a good deal to me. Yeah. To buy it off the boats. Yeah, absolutely. The cannery, uh, you mentioned processing uh, sardines locally. Where were those canneries? Monterey. Oh, they, they, they truck it up to Monterey? They truck up in Monterey. In fact, even from, uh, if they catch sardines down in Port Wanimi and Ventura, those are all trucked to Monterey. There's Del Monte, there's uh, Monterey Fish Company, there's about two, two big canneries up there. Have you seen the Salinas uh, sardine cannery? Yes, I did. Beautiful? Yeah, that's the one I just surveyed, there's two boats up there. Yeah, Sal Tringali, yeah. Yeah, nice man. Yeah. They're, Beautiful. Oh latest and the best they can just they put little mackerel and stuff in there they run through the assembly line they come out all packaged one pound I mean all frozen everything all done and packed I mean it's fantastic was that a good investment hopefully they're hoping it is there's supposed to be quite a biomass of uh, fish but uh, I don't know they're not there right now they're too small but there's a huge biomass of sardines uh, this year, so they're looking forward to it, but there, you couldn't even buy a sardine up there right now. There's none for sale, none available, it, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. the, does the cannery uh, have a, an alternate product that they, they can? And that well, they have squid, they have sardines, they have mackerel, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so far the canneries are sitting up there empty. Mm -hmm. I know the guy who owns the Monterey cannery there real well, 
And I went up there and did a survey the last week, and, and he said, Joey, he said, there's nothing. Plants laying idle. He says, two months, we haven't done a thing. You know, you have multi-million dollars invested in that plant and that property, and you know, there's ongoing expense. And, and just beginning to wonder, you know, what's, I, I bet you, I would just think the other day, how much do you think a cannery like that cost? Maybe 15, 20 million? Oh, I know they put millions. Oh, in yeah, absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful. All stainless steel, everything. I mean, it's fabulous. It's got its ups and downs, you know. And if you, The way I look at it is if a fisherman has his boat paid for, it's free and clear, he may be able to survive. But the fishermen don't need too much. They're not people who are big spenders and anything like that. They're used. A fisherman works hard with his hands and he has courage in his heart, you know, and he's not a big spendthrift. I mean, they're, they're pretty cautious, pretty level, and they, they, they watch themselves pretty good. And they live in modest homes. Those guys in, my, in Southern California, those big, uh, big purse sailors, they had, I remember one time that we were all on strike, we couldn't get a price for albacore, and, and one of the senators came down, and here this guy drives down, his wife drives down in a fur coat and a big fancy Porsche, you know. He says, there's just tough times down here, you know. I thought, God, of all the things, you know, to, to come down there like that. But there was some very, very wealthy fishermen down there, very wealthy. But uh, now, you know, that's all gone. Yeah. There's no more cannery. There is not one cannery on the West Coast now that, that processes albacore. Huh? Somebody's out here. I want to see. Oh, it's uh, Nancy. Oh, did you know her? Uh, more rock, you know, has been used to make breakwaters for Avila, for Long Beach, and our breakwater, and and they were blasting away on it pretty heavily, and and I thought one day, gee, there should be something done here. We don't want this thing blasted into little pieces. So, I got Charlie Judson from the Telegram Tribune, and Colonel Andrew Daly, and when I called Colonel Peacock, who was the chief of the engineers here, everybody was writing letters and everything. Nothing could be done. So one of my good friends says, you've got to get Colonel Peacock on your side. He said, or you forget it. So I called up and I made a date with Colonel Peacock and I said, Colonel, you know, can we come down and want to talk to you about the rock? Okay. So I went down and his aides came out and he was short I got a very sharp quip, you know, and uh, one of the guys said, no, don't, he's, be careful how you talk to Colonel Peacock. He's very, you know, he's very touchy, you know. So one of the first thing they had, they, we went and there were three of us sat down and they had coffee and cookies and everything. And pretty soon Colonel Peacock says, uh, Mr. Giannini, what do you want here? I said, well, Colonel, we want more rock saved. I said, I think it's a treasure. It's a pristine thing. And I said, uh, he said, well, you want a breakwater, don't you? I said, yes, we do. But I said, not for more rock. He said, what would you say? I said, and his aides looked at me and they just about passed out. Geez, you're arguing with Colonel Peacock? I mean, and I said, yes. I said, there's other rocks around. I said, look, I said, this rock has to be preserved, you know. And he went on talking and he looked at me pretty soon. He says, well, Mr. Giannini, I remember something you did in Norbay. You made me come up with $185,000 to dredge part of your channel. And I did. We went out, myself and a group of people from Baywood, Los Osos, and we got $30,000 to get the 185000 And he says, you know, that's only the second time in the history of the Southwest Pacific that that's been done. He said, for private little individuals like Moore Bay. And he said, what do you want me to do? I said, just write to the Chief of Rivers and Harbors and tell them that we want more rock, please. And he says, I'll grant your wish. <laughs> but. He said, you know something? He said, when this is all done, nobody will ever know who did it. The elephants are going to trample all over you. This guy was sharp. Your name's not going to be on the club plaque over there, he said. No. He said, but you remember what you did, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. You know. So we all shook hands and walked out. And sure enough, Colonel ba ba uh, uh, Bert Talcott was our congressman. Oh, he announces that more rock has been placed in... <laughs> in a preserve, you know, and all that. And I thought, well, gee, that's great, you know. And then the other thing was the preservation of more raw, I mean, more of keeping, I sponsored Measure D, which is to preserve the area from uh, Beach Street to, to more rock as, you know, it, to leave it as it is, that it cannot expand 
beyond fisheries, you know, or pleasure, uh, sport fishing, which means no more restaurants, no more anything. We couldn't say no, you know, to anything, but we said it was limited to, and that ordinance passed. And uh, so we were happy that that's kind of put away. They tried to break it here a couple of years ago because one of the fellows that bought the property there, the Down Dindock property, where Coleman Drive is, that uh, Coleman Drive is granted in perpetuity. If it's ever moved, that's the end of Coleman Drive. I mean, development can take on to the rock there. And of course, John Dindock saw the property of John King, and King was a friend of one of the councilmen here, and they tried, but we had a big meeting out there at the Rock, 150 people came, and that was changed. So, you know, and then Coleman Drive itself, you know, PG&E, when they started that plant, they had started to build a fence all the way down from 9th Street, all the way down to the revetment there. And I came in, I, was, I came in from Ketchikan, Alaska, and I was kind of tired, it was a Friday afternoon, and, and I looked, you know, we I docked the boat, and I see a fence going up, you know, and, and uh, I said, uh, the guy said, what's going on here? He said, oh, he said, what is it to you? And I said, well, I live here, and I want to know what you're doing. And he said, uh, well, I said, P.G., and you bought this property, he says, and they're fencing this thing off. I said, you mean to tell me that someday we're not going to get over to the rock? He says, I have nothing to say about it. So Saturday night, I called the supervisor. He was a school teacher, Paul Andrew. And I said, Paul, I said, I'm really incensed here. He said, what's the problem? I said, I want to see you in the morning, Sunday morning. I said, we're going to talk about this thing. So sure enough, Sunday morning, he came over, and he was an older guy, you know. Yeah, but, well, he was about 70 then, not as old as I am. But anyway, he came over and he said, what's the problem? I said, they're blocking off 9th Street. I said, what's this all about? He said, well, what's it to you? And I said, well, I said, we want that left open. I said, come on. I said, you know, you either make your, change your mind on that or I'm going to start a recall on you. He said, you son of a bitch, he says to me just like that. He just started shaking all over. And I said, okay. I said, Paul, I said, I'm warning you. So about two days later, he calls me. He says, uh, can you come over Friday? He says, uh, he says I got the uh, people from PG&E coming over. He says, to meet with me. And I said, sure. So Art Coleman who was my good friend. When I was gone fishing, he'd take over for the waterfront. A great guy, wonderful man. I was the enforcer and he was a swab. Always wore a fedora hat and a suit. Great, wonderful man. I still see him, you know. And uh, so anyway, uh, we go over there and here was two guys from PG&E. And I said, well, I said, okay. I said, uh, what's on your mind, Mr. Gin? And he, I said, I'm, I'm disturbed. I said, you're blocking off 9th Street. And he said, what's 9th Street mean to you? I said, it means to me that one of these days we want to go over to the Rock. There's a little beach area there. And I don't think that you should take home and drive away from us. I said, in any shape, way, shape, or form. And I said, I'm not going to buy that. And he said, well, okay. He said, we got engineering designs. He said, we can move back 187 feet. That's as far as we can move back for our plant. But we have to have the outfall line. He said, would you be acceptable to that? And I said, well, yes, that's a good compromise. I said, I'll buy that. And so that part of it was saved, you know I mean? There's a lot of things that have happened that people don't know anything about, you know I mean? That, that, that went on in my lifetime here in Moore Bay, you know, and, and that I feel proud that I did it, you know, that I, and, and I, I, the problem with me is that I am an overly sensitive guy, you know, and I, I take things seriously and I, I just can't accept things sometimes as they are. I just, I just won't, you know. And uh, so Art and I, we had great, great times together. I mean, uh, he was such a wonderful man and, and I had such a respect for him. We were like brothers almost, you know, I mean, and uh, he lived there in Baywood and, and he always was interested in the fishermen the fishing boats and, and stuff. I mean, that's only part of some of the things that went on here. You know, there's a lot. Is the, is the drive named after him? Yeah, the drive's named after him. When they had a meeting here about, you know, Coleman Drive, and I was fishing at that time, you know, and I said, Art, I said, watch Coleman Drive. I started drive for Coleman Drive. He said, okay. So he gets a few business people, you know, and he was just as happiest guy, you know, and he gets... These business people rounded up and they had a meeting down there and, and the, sure enough the Board of Supervisors came through and paved the street. Then when it came to naming it, the Chamber of Commerce said, look, Art Coleman worked on this and he deserves to have his name on Coleman Drive. And they said, that's a good idea. So Edie Morrison, who was, she just died here just recently, she said, that sounds great. And so we put his name on it, you know. <laughs>
So he got the credit for it, which was great. He deserved it, you know, a great guy. And, uh, you know, there's uh, lots and lots of things, you know. When you think of 55 years that I've lived here, you know, and, and we started with a little town of 850 people, you know, and now we're 10,000 and 20,000 during the summer months. You know, that's a great change in a little town. And there's a lot of things I would have wanted to see different, you know, when we started incorporating. I, I felt as a businessman that we needed a lot of things done, you know, be, before the bureaucracy got so great. You know, I mean, we campaigned on the, uh, that we only needed seven policemen. Well, right away we get 22 policemen. Well, okay, fine. My thoughts were, here you've got all these millions. Let's fix up our water supply system because our pipes are rotten. You know, I mean, they're, they're just, they're gone. You know, I mean, one of these days, he's going to flow the bond issue should have to pay for it. And here they fix all these streets and leave the old lines in, which means one of these days they're going to have to tear them all up again. You know, I mean, that's the kind of thinking you have. And, uh, but, uh, you know, they didn't do it. Big policemen. We had a volunteer fire department, really nice guys, all good workers, you know energetic and knowledgeable, you know, the way they hired you. Another eight or ten firemen, you know, and the bureaucracy started, you know, booming out, you know, uh, city manager and then an assistant city manager, plane director and then an assistant, a harbor manager, I mean, all these people, you know, drawing big salaries, you know, and stuff. And so what happens to, to our little infrastructure? Nothing, you know. One well, of these days, we say, well, you're going to have to pay for it, just like Baywood. You know, there was a time in Tel Los Sostos when the, you could have got 12, and all the city would have, the Losos would have had to pay for was 12 and a half percent. The rest of it would have been federally financed, right. but people wouldn't buy it, you know. But nobody tried to sell it either. Nobody said, look, this is time to do anything, you know. And there were some good guys there. It was Colonel Andrew Daly, Victor Brunelli, uh, other names I can't remember, but there were some great people lived there. But somehow or another, they never took an active part in things. If they would have, things would have been different. You wouldn't be faced with your face now. See, that thing's going to go probably a lot more than even they're saying now. Always. You know, it's, it was for 71 million under the county, and then, oh, we'll do it for 30 million less, and now it's up to 91 million. And probably that isn't even going to cover it, you know. It's just, yeah, it's just unbelievable, you know, what goes on. So... So anyway, those are a little bit of the things I enjoyed in this yeah. town. Well, you, you actually came here before the, the PG&E power plant was built. Oh, yeah, sure. And uh, you're now seeing the, the plan where the stacks might come down. Uh, what do you think about those changes? Well, I don't know. I just wish the plant wasn't here myself. I, I really do, because I think we're breathing a lot of stuff we don't like, whether we like it or not. There's oxides and stuff that they don't tell us anything about. Now they're pumping, you know, full capacity, which is not good. You know, that means more oxides in the air. And we're breathing that stuff, you know. I was gone fishing, and they slipped this thing through. Had I been here, I was up in Alaska at that time. If I'd have been here, I'd have fought that tooth and nail. I probably wouldn't have won, but... I probably could have, you know, done something about it. the theory uh, that they sold the thing. I look at the big tax base. Well, at that time we weren't even a city. That was 1952. We were still part of the county. We went uh, for 10 years, 11 years, never collected a nickel on that money. The, the, the former sheriff, uh, was it Merrick, owned that land? Paul Merrick. Paul Merrick. No, no, that was all property belonged to the state. Oh, it did. Okay. Right, it was all property belonged to the state. Well, it belonged to the government first because that was the Navy base. There were three buildings down there. You know where the North Tee Pier is? Yeah. There were three big buildings. They were about 200 feet long, and they were about 60 feet wide, Quonset buildings. And the one building closest to the dock, they could pull their 60-foot boat up. It had a ways on there, and they could pull even my boat up there. They didn't do it, but they had their own ways up in there. The other two buildings were all full of uh, equipment, you know, I mean, engine parts and engines and pumps. The part where PG&E is now, that was a bomb shelter. They had bomb shelters there. Huge doors, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, would open, you know, and they would store bombs underneath there. I mean, it was just such a beautiful sight. To me, it was the Miami Beach of Moore Bay, you know. I mean, it was just gorgeous, you know. 
And I come back and I see this thing gone. I mean, it just tore me apart, really. They had swimming pools there, tennis courts, because, you know, it was the soldiers and sailors and stuff, you know, would use that. Mm -hmm. And you could drive around the whole periphery of the thing there. And I, and I just thought it was wonderful. And when they came back and told us that, I just about died, you know. I said, I can't believe that they could sell this out. And they did it so quickly. You know, they did it so quickly because nobody was here to buck it. You know, everybody, well, we need a tax base, we need a tax base, yeah. But, you know, for the few, first few years, we were breeding all that they were using, that crude oil, oh, yes. and uh, stored up in those tanks up there. And, and that's what we were breeding, you know. And, geez, our cars would be covered with uh, soot and stuff. You burn the paint, you, they wouldn't argue with you. They'd just, oh, you paint your car, no problem. You know, it was fine. You know, they wanted a good relationship because they were poisoning us, you know. And uh, to me, there's nothing that's worth, you know, more than your health. You can have all the money you want, but if you haven't got your health, you got nothing. And I think this world has come to the point where we're going to have to conserve. And it's got to come. Maybe the hard way, but we're going to conserve. All this waste that people have been used to for all these years is going to come to an end. It's got to come. And we're just beginning now. We haven't seen anything yet. You just wait. You know, everything is finite. Fuel is finite. I was reading an article by the CIA the other day, you know. And what do you think is the most critical thing that the CIA is concerned about in this world? It's not fuel, it's water. Oh, absolutely. Water is the number one thing that concerns this, you know, that was in the CIA report. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah you know. Fuel we might have for another hundred years, but we're going to have to get down to electric cars and different things. It's, it's got to come. I mean, there's too much humanity, you know, too much population, and, uh, and, and we're using too much resource for nothing, wasting it. You know, my kids are not used to uh, knowing how to conserve and uh, cut down electric lights. I mean, I turn around, turn off my electric lights all the time. Because when we were little, we had coal oil lamps. We didn't have any lights, you know, and uh, <laughs> we didn't even have any toilets. You know, we had to go outside in the outhouse and, and stuff. And, you know, people don't realize. But we lived, you know, life was okay. It wasn't all that bad. You know, the only part I see that where we've gained is in medical knowledge. You know, I think we've done great advances in that. But as far as everything else is conserved, I think... We're, we're a wasteful people, and it's got to slow down. These big cars and, you know, waste of millions of tons of rubber that we burn off these cars that's floating into the air that we don't even think about, you know, and stuff. It's, it's and uh, oxides in the air. This morning I seen a paper where you know, the acid rain is still prevalent in spite of everything they're doing. So they give us MTBA and poisonous our water, you know? <laughs> yeah. Was your father a fisherman? No, you know, he was kind of a rancher. Well, was. Yeah, I never really had a father, to be honest about it, you know. I don't like to even mention it, but he abandoned us, and liquor was his downfall, you know, and stuff. And So we grew up the hard way. What, what's your date of birth? July 28th, yeah. I went to Italy. Uh, uh, my mother went to Italy. We were four brothers. Uh, three of us lived and three died in our family, 50%. And we went to Italy when I was seven years old. And uh, I lost my brother there in Italy, the little boy. He was about less than a year old. And uh, Mussolini was just coming into power. That was 1924. And conditions were pretty brutal there. You know, I mean, it was, uh, it was pretty terrible. Uh, you know, people, we don't appreciate freedom, you know, but uh, we take it for granted. But it isn't all that good everywhere, you know. and, and uh, God, young people were being herded and arrested. You know, if you said something about Mussolini, even to your own brother, you'd have to be grabbed. We had our neighbor who was our father when we were there. He was so good to us. He'd bring us oranges or some fruit, you know, and stuff. And one night, the 12 o'clock, you know, I boom, 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 boom. You know, I hear the horses, you know, with cobbled streets. And, Mom, what's that? I, I almost lost my life in Italy, too, you know, because you know, the, I was paralyzed from the grief, you know. And uh, when uh, these uh, horses came by, I said, my mother, what's going on? Shh, don't say nothing. You know, people couldn't talk to one another. Not even the neighbors would talk to one another. They were scared. And they grabbed this poor guy and hauled him away. 
We never saw him anymore. We were there two years, you know, two and a half years. We never saw the poor guy again. He said something or did something. I can remember one time vividly that we were walking, we were down, you know, we were about three blocks from, we were in Sicily, and uh, we were about three blocks from town. My mother goes uptown, and, and uh, here was these men, young men, you know, two brass tied up with a stick across their arm, and some guy said something, you know, and the soldier punches him with a, you know, bayonet in his butt, you know, and the guy starts crying, he falls down, he says, Mom, what's the matter, you know? Shh, you know, he couldn't say nothing. He must have made a nasty remark, and uh, I mean, there was no mercy. One of the kids we played with, I mean, uh, we you know, played through things together. One night, about two, one more, 11 o'clock more, you had to have a pass, if you didn't have a password, after nine o'clock, you were dead if you were out in the street. You had to have a password. And uh, so I hear a gunshot. I said to my mom, what's going on? We looked outside and here this kid was shot dead. You know, my God, you know I me. Mean? And my mother said, we gotta get out of here. We gotta get out of this country, you know. Well, we couldn't get any money to come back, you know. But I had, my mother had a brother. She, the reason she went there, she had a sister and a mother she wanted to see. But she also had a brother and a twin sister in Portland. And my dad was gone, so we didn't know where he was. So she writes her brother and says, can we come, you know, make it get back to, you know, we want to come back to Portland. Well, they raised, I think it was $180 for the whole family to come back. But we go to make a trip you know, to come back, and the immigration officers wouldn't let me through. Uh, well, I was yellow jaundiced and all kinds of things. I don't know what was going on, but I couldn't eat. And so the immigration officer says to me, what's the matter? And I said, nothing. I don't like, you know, something, you know. So he said, well, I'll come back in a month. He said, get some food, come back in a month. So my mother was strict Catholic, you know, and she goes over to this witch. This woman was a, you know, and she told the whole story. She said, oh, she said, I'll get him through, no problem. She said, I'll hypnotize the guy. So she gives me a little packet to take with me and some saints to put in my pocket. And in a month, we went back, you know, to go back. And she comes over. And so this guy, he comes over, and we sit in this wicker chair. And he says, how do you feel? And I said, oh, I feel all right. And he says, uh, um, he says, what's the matter with you? And I said, I hate Mussolini. I was nine years old, nine and a half. He said, you hate Mussolini? He said, why, you know? And this woman, she just goes crazy. My mom, she starts biting her fingers, you know. You know, time, you, know you know, you bite your fingers if you, you hurt, you know. And so I told him what it, a couple things happened. He said, well, he says to my mother, he said, you better get back to the United States. He said, you better go back. And so we came across and he ordered an orange for me and a little bottle of milk <laughs> every day, you know for three of us, you know. Well, I shared that orange and the milk with my two brothers, you know. But, you know, those are things that, you know, you don't forget, you think about, you know. I mean, so when, you know, you, you think about some people, how they live in the world, and you hear all these skirmishes and fights and Albanians and the, you know, Macedonians and the Slavs and stuff like that. I mean, think of what life must be like for the people, you know, that live in those countries. We have no idea you know, what it's like. Until you've been through part of it, you don't know. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, anybody that ever lived around dictators like Mussolini, it, it was pretty tough, pretty tough. I mean, it was no mercy for nobody. But then in the end, he gets it too, see? What year was that, Joe? 1924, oh, well, we went 1922. I was seven, and we left 1924. I was a little over two and a quarter years, I think two years and three months. So I was uh, seven, nine, a little over nine and a half. I couldn't speak a word of English, Italian, uh, English uh, when I came back from Italy. I, and I couldn't speak a, a word of English when I went to school as I was in first grade, not a single word. I remember a teacher picking me up <laughs> and talking to me and I couldn't understand a word she was saying, you know. And I picked it up real fast. Seven years old, I learned English. I go back to Italy, I come back and I forgot my English again, you know. <laughs> but I picked it up fast. I had to start back and here I was, nine and a half years old, going back to the first grade, you know, and I felt like a heel. I said, this isn't going to be. And boy, I started working days and nights studying and pretty soon I got back to my class again, you know. But <laughs> So life hadn't all been a bowl of cherries, you know. But <laughs> But I worked hard all my life. I mean, uh, and never, Did never to took a person in my life, huh? Did you go to college? No, no? never school. went to high school. Never 
never even went to high school. One year. <laughs> yeah, I had to get out. My mother was dying with cancer and, and younger brothers. I mean, I had to get out and work. Dollar a day, 10 hours. <laughs> I worked in a fruit stand for these uh, Turkish Jews, and, and you worked. Uh, and at the end of the day, he'd give you a silver dollar. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting, though. But yeah, out of it, I think it makes better people out of you sometimes, you know, really. I, I, I can understand people's views, and I sympathize with people who are suffering, that, uh, that are going through turmoils and different things in these foreign countries, you know. And, and we sit back here, and, well, all right, we got our television, and, and our bellies are full, and oh, the hell with the rest of it, you know. And we have some hardships in this country, too. People, you know, they're uh, in hardships. And a lot of people have created their own hardships. I mean, they went in debt, you know, head over heels. Nobody had been taught in school to conserve, be careful, you know, because times aren't always going to be good. You know, just spend, spend, spend. You know, that's the theory. Get a credit card, go charge it all up. You know, just down to store, you know, I see sometimes two or three bills come back, you know. Young people going to Cal Poly, charge up stuff and don't pay for it. Wait a minute, you know, that isn't right. You know, but you see, they don't care. It's One last a, question about Morro Bay. Yeah. Is it true that during World War II, the Navy had a secret submarine base under Morro Rock? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Really? No. <laughs> I had a, a, an aside. Was the Embarcadero already in place when you got here? Yeah, the Embarcadero was in place, yeah. They'd, they'd already been yeah. the riprap? The, yeah, right, it was riprap. And you couldn't go beyond Beach Street. Uh, anything beyond that was all sand. I mean, you couldn't get on. There was nothing beyond that. At the foot of Beach Street, uh, Andy Alden had a little smoked fish house, and he smoked fish there. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing that was there, nothing else. And uh, people would come from all over the valley, you know, the Portuguese people and people from the valley would come because he had the best smoked fish, and, and uh, he made it all himself. He would, you know, make it right there. You could smell it two or three blocks away, and uh, the rest of it was closed. And yes, there was a lot of Navy landing craft there. Now, the South Teep here, that had, uh, it was about 30 feet higher than this, and it had two towers on it, like airplane towers. And the soldiers would then you'd run up these ladders, there's, you know, uh, not ladders, but steps going up, four steps going up, and then there was Jacob's ladders going down. And the soldiers would come, run up there and come down the Jacob's ladder onto the landing craft and run over to the beach, you know, and, and stuff like that. It was, it was a training base. It was a training base, that's what it was, you know. It was a strictly a training base, you know. And uh, there was quite a few men here then. And, that was all fairly new, though, huh? I mean, it was only, it was less than 10 years old. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, you couldn't go to the North Teep here because you couldn't get by 9th Street because the Navy had that all closed. And the Army had it closed, too. Sometimes we'd be sleeping here at night, wing, crash, you'd hear landing crafts running into each other, you know. <laughs> They'd bang away and... Was the city blacked out at that time? Pardon? Was the city blacked out? You couldn't... Could you have street lights? Well, we didn't. We weren't a city then. Well, uh, yeah. Was, was the community? Did were you allowed to have lights on it? Oh no, not during the war. No, uh, uh no, no. They were. Well, you probably read where they sunk that ship up there. Submarine sank that yes. tanker up there. You've read about that. Yeah. 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 I wasn't here then. Like I said, I came in '46. Right. And, right after. That's, I was yeah. just wondering if they had, that's why I asked about the Embarcadero, because they, yeah. they did that like in 45 or, or somewhere right in there. I didn't know if they'd done Oh, you mean to build out thing. from Beach Street? Right. Yeah, right. that's, yeah, that started probably in the 40s, early right. 40s, right. The, the, the county was leasing out the land and, uh, you know, you could, it was, you know, you could rent the waterfront 25 cents a front foot for a month. Mm -hmm. You could rent a 100-foot lease for $25 a month. Uh -huh. And Paul Merrick was the supervisor. He said, Joey, why don't you get 100 feet? He said, man, just for an investment. You know, it's, uh, no, I don't want it, you know. I mean, 25 cents a, a front foot for the waterfront. Uh -huh. Now, see, the city's buying some for half a million dollars. That corner where that, you go down Beach Street and that, where that building is, they sell the, 
uh, sports stuff there, you know, surfboards and stuff. That whole corner was for sale for $3,100. And some friends of mine from Newport, Oregon bought it. They just, ah, we can buy it. What'd you buy it for? He said, ah, I'm just going to buy it, you know. And they bought it. And I think they sold it for pretty good profit, you know. But uh, uh, the property was just so cheap, you know. One time, uh, the guy that uh, had the, uh, the meatpacking plant in Paso Robles, George, uh, uh, geez, right now his last name doesn't come to me, but anyway, he wanted me to go down Newport Beach with him, uh, you know, to Balboa Island. And I said, sure, I went. No, I didn't go with him. I went with the guy that bought my house, you know, that I bought my house from. He wanted to go down there and look for a piece of property. I see this beautiful lot on Balboa Island, big lot. And the real estate man said, boy, if you want a lot, he says, here it is, 25,000 bucks. 25,000 for a lot? They were selling for 200, 300, 400 dollars here. And he said, yeah, he says, it's a bargain. Uh, I told this friend of mine up here about it, and he just sends a check down for it. He sold it a year later for, I think, 250,000 dollars. I went to a tax sale in 1952. There was 850 lots for sale. The minimum bid was 125 bucks. Well, the biggest price of the lot went in that corner house right across there. Two Portuguese got in a big battle over this lot. $850. The one Portuguese says, he's not going to get it. And the other guy says, he's not going to get it. And so, and it was $850 for one lot. These lots, my house, this lot, these corner lots, 200, two and a quarter, and I buy four lots up there on the Heights. I paid 340 for one, 410, 420, and 450, four lots up there. And I sold them for $1,000 a piece. Oh, I've doubled my money, haven't I? Well, when the sale was all over, there was 59 lots, unbid, $125, minimum bid. So Earl Roberts had an electric store down there. He, was, uh, he had a nice business there, and we were good friends. He's got this home right here on the corner. He said, Joe, let's divide them up. I said, he said, you take 29, I'll take, you know, whatever. He said, let's split them, 59 lots. I said, Earl, I really don't want it. It was less than $8,000, 70 some hundred dollars. He said, if you don't buy them, I'll take them. I said, well, go ahead. <laughs> I turned them down, you know. <laughs> you know, 59 lots for $125 a piece. And no one bought them because there was trees on them or something, you know, people just didn't want them. They just weren't available. That property down there where the Beacon Station is and the Exxon Station, that was, that was, that lot went from the street clear down to there. It was an acre and a quarter. And there was a big house on there. It was all berry bushes, you know, blackberry bushes around there. Well, the owners, people died and was sold through the estate. And the high bid, you know, a friend of mine went and he said, Joe, let's go. You know, together. He says, I'll, I'll bid on it. And I said, okay. And he bid $10,200 on that corner, that whole acre and a quarter. So he came to me and said, let's go 50-50 on it. He was a fisherman. I, I don't want it. I didn't want to be bothered, you know. <laughs> well, he sold it for 185000 bucks, and that's by worth a million, you know. <laughs> well, the Scripps building, I bought that building and I paid 50000 No, I paid 32000 for it. Now think about that for that building. Scripps people said, we'll rent it for whatever you want. He said, we'll buy it for you. But we want a 10-year lease. And I said, well, if I said, ask 50000 will you take it? He said, yeah, we'll take it, absolutely. So they wrote me out a check for it. <laughs> Heck, today it's worth 450000 you know? So there, you know, things have happened. But it's all money. You know, who cares? You know, I mean, guys, look what you passed up. I said, I don't care. I said, I'm still alive and I'm 86. And still doing pretty good, you know, for my for my age, you know. So I kick, you know. Those great adventures. Huh? Yeah. You had all these great adventures. Oh yeah, Jesus. Yeah, the ocean adventures were my biggest thrill, though. Being in the ocean. Talk about submarines popping up. I was going one night. I was uh, below Point Sur, and it was a beautiful night, just flat, calm, and the moon was sun. I mean, the moon was out, and the water was just glistening, you know. And all at once, about 100 yards from me, a submarine pops up. <laughs> Jesus, it just startled me. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. And you know, you're just you half dozy anyway. It's cold and your stove is on. And 
everything. And I see this thing, I go, God, what in the hell is that, you know? And it was a submarine surfaced, you know, just popped out of the water. It was, you know, just scared the daylights out of me, you know? And I, I, every time I hear about that Japanese ship that sank, I think about that. I wasn't maybe 100 yards from it when they popped up. Was, it, was that the strangest thing you've ever seen on the ocean? Oh, no, not probably. Uh, another strange phenomenon that I never uh, fully understood. We were coming up, we were about 100, we were fishing Albacore, and, and we were about 150 miles outside of Point Conception. I had a very deep fathom meter at that time. We didn't have all these sounders now, but I had one that could sound down to 2,000 fathoms by echo. You know, I mean, you could time the echo and you could tell pretty close where you were. And we were coming up and, you know, we trade places at nighttime. You stay up two or three hours and then your crewman sleeps. And so I was up, it was about one o'clock in the morning, I was just sitting there and pretty soon everything around the boat lit up. Whew, I could see streamers going up. I pulled throttle back and, and my crewman, you know, I was kind of half dozy anyway. My crewman jumps out of bed and said, Joe, what is it? He said, where's that light coming from? I said, Jesus, I don't know. I said, you know, and I stopped the boat dead still, you know, and I said, God, you know, and these lights last about 50 maybe 15 minutes, you know, and there were like streamers going up all around, you know. I said, am I crazy? Am I seeing something? I said, do you see it? Or maybe I'm having hallucinations here. He said, no, he said, I see it. He said, it scares the daylights on me. He said, what is it? I said, I don't know. I turned my sounder on, and hell, I was down 2,000 feet, you know, I mean, way, way offshore, 2,200 fathoms. And I still don't know to this day what, what that was. I mean, it was just a phenomenon that I've never seen anything like that before. But all at once, out of the blue, and here I'm sitting down, you know, and just kind of dozing along, boats on the pilot, you know, and the house warm, you know, cold out there, you know, and this, this light just pops up from nowhere. You know, never to this day will I ever know whatever that was. I mean, I've never seen anything like it before, never again, whether it was some maneuvers to the Army or Navy or whatever, but it didn't look that way to me because it was quite massive in size, you know. But uh, that's probably one of the only phenomenon of that type that I ever saw, you know. Oh, you see a lot of things in the ocean, but uh, but that was one of them that was kind of weird, you know. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah, weird. And if I'd have been alone, I'd have thought Joe's dreaming, you know, he's having hallucinations, you know. But my crewman was right there to back me up. He said, Joe, he said, I see it too. And I said, okay. <laughs> so, wild. yeah. Well, this yeah. sounds like material for an X-File episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll yeah. Scully out on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's but I had fun off. fishing. <laughs> In my days when I fished, uh, we were more homogeneous. The, the fishermen all helped one another. I mean, we had what we called a silent hour, where at noon every day we would transfer information from all over the coast, you know, everybody would get off the air, and we would all talk to one another, you know, by, by radio. What's to do off Moore Bay? What's it off up at Astoria? What's at uh, Eureka and, and down in Mexico? So we could get the information and go wherever fishermen were, you know, I mean, and, and we all help one another to a great extent, you know, I mean, it was just a... Today, it's not that way anymore. Uh, fishermen, maybe six or eight of them, will have codes. They go what they call code boats, yeah. and they operate on the codes. So just you, just this little bunch here knows what's going on, and it's, uh, I don't know. Reasonable. It wouldn't be my type of life that I would want anymore. It's, it's too much of a, I don't know, whether they're hungry, whether they're... Uh, I, I don't know what it is, you know, but it's not the same. I, I, won't, I would say this, that a fisherman will help you under any condition if you're in distress. But when it comes to the other part of it, of finding fish or anything, no, it's not done anymore. If you're not in that code, in that boat, you don't know what they are. When they talk, it's talking in code. So you don't know what actually you have, or, you know, unless you belong to that code group and stuff. That's not the way it was when I was fishing. <clears throat> it was a different world altogether. It's more competitive now. Yeah, more competitive, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I guess that's what it is. I don't know. It was, it was tough then, too. You know, I mean, things weren't all that rosy, but we still help one another. But you've got a new breed of people now, you know, in the fishing industry. You know, I think we were all raised differently. I mean, we were all, people were from my generation then you know, 40, 50 years ago, 
moved from my generation. Today, it's a newer generation, and uh, I think uh, their ideals and things are different than what we had. You think it's a result of that there's fewer young people coming into the fishery? It's, uh... No, I don't think so. I think it's just, uh, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I think probably greedy or something, you know. But uh, I've always believed in if sharing what I had with others and helping them because they helped me in return. You know, we all work together to that effect. And, and as a result, you know, everybody profited by it. But today, it's not that way anymore. I think it's also indicative of a, a social trend in its entirety. It's yeah. like you can, there used to be neighborhoods yes. that were real neighborhoods. Right. You knew all of your neighbors. It ain't that now way no more. Live side by side for you don't even know your next door neighbor hardly. They don't even know each yeah. other. Yeah, I know. I think yeah. that's really the same. It used to be a fishing community yeah. as a whole. Right. And now it's segregated. That's right, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a different world you face now. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I don't know, it might be better, but I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. And I don't think it's going to get any better until things get tougher and people get back down to earth again. And it's going to come back. What goes around comes around, you know. I mean, it goes around, comes around. And I think was... You know, when we were poor, we were all helping one another. You know, Godmother would do this, and if you were sick, they'd bring you chicken soup or something. Everybody helped one another, you know what I mean? And it, it, everybody knew you, everybody was a friend, your neighbor, your household, everybody around blocks you knew. And today, you don't see that in, anymore, like you said. It's just not there. But again, what I was trying to say is that when you're poor, you tend to be more human. As you get more wealthy and affluent, it goes this way, you start separating, you know, and you're not the same as you were. You didn't, don't depend on anybody anymore. I'm independent now. I've got mine, and I'm wealthy, and to heck with it, and uh, it's not the right attitude. You know, when you lose the love of your fr and friends and your neighbors, you lose the love of yourself as well, and that's, that's part of what's not so good. I mean, we, we've got to get out of that shell. And I think it's going to come. I, I don't know. I look at economic conditions now, and it's very worrisome, really, if you look at it objectively. I mean, we've got a crisis in fuel. We've got a crisis. People don't realize you go buy a tank of gas now, and it costs you ten dollars more. I mean, that's money that's drained, billions drained out of the economy. Somebody's getting it. It isn't us. If you read the paper this morning, what these electric companies in Texas are doing, did you see that article today in the paper? <gasps> They've robbed us out of billions and billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Duke Energy is one of them, and two other ones down in Texas, Bush's home state. They're robbing the public, blind, you know. And is that right? I mean, you know, this kind of greed, you know? It isn't, to my estimation. Because you take electricity, you take uh, gas, you take electric, you know, everything. Gasoline, I mean, the public is being drained dry, and they don't even know it. Well, and you look at our food. The part they don't know. Yeah. Food. It bothers me that, uh, you know, as a, as a fisherman. Sure. You know, I grew up, we could go clamming and abalone and yeah. fishing here. Uh, that helped to supplement our, all of our income so we could yeah. get sure. food out of the ocean. And uh, as that's more restricted, um, what would... happens to our food supply? Yeah. Does the price of food go right. up along with the energy? And sure. all of a sudden, you have no more disposable yeah. income it's right. all for necessities. They'll all be coming in from foreign countries. Mm -hmm. Canada and other countries are shipping stuff in right and left. I mean, we used to be able to go paddle across the bay on the other side and pick up all the pismo clams we wanted, you know. Well, 10, you know, which was a limit. Mm -hmm. Big pismo clams, you know. Uh, you go out by the rock there and there was those razor clams. Mm -hmm. You go pick 20 razor clams. I mean, there were just all kinds of gooey ducks in the bay and little, those little neck clams. I mean, you could just go there and find a puddle and get 50 of them, you know. I mean, where is that anymore? It's all gone, you know. So it's, some things are better and some things aren't. And like I say, my concern right now is for the fishing industry. I go in my store and it makes me just sick to see that sometimes three, four, five people maybe in a day 
Jody had my son has cancer, you know, and he hasn't been able to work. And uh, so, you know, he's got his son comes there and helps him. And I went there a few times and and then the, another guy helps. But uh, stay there two, three hours. Another person comes in the store. And I think, God, you know, I mean, this is unbelievable to me. You know, just I can't I can't can't believe it. Laid off George. Pardon? George that worked there. He. Uh, Jerry, you mean? Well, Jerry's there, but there was a gentleman named George that worked there a few years ago. He no longer. Uh, no, you mean a few days ago? Did you say? No, a few years ago. Oh, George. Uh, yeah, there's been so. No, they're not there anymore. No. No, it's just Jerry now, and uh, and Jody goes down a little bit. He's taking chemotherapy now, and and uh, maybe you know they might arrest it. I hope. Kidney cancer. He, he went to a local doctor here, a urologist, a year ago, and a, a year ago this month, and the doctor looked at it, and he said, I think he said this kidney has to be removed. And, and he goes, ooh, wait a minute, you know. He said, well, Jody, so I'll tell you what, I'll have my colleagues look at it. There's the five urologists in one clinic, and so he looked at it, uh, sent it to his colleagues. He said, we're all the same opinion. He says this kidney should be removed. And my son says, Doc, he says, I appreciate what you've done, but I want a second opinion. He said, okay. He said, I'll make a date for you to go down to USC because they have everything, you know, to deal with this stuff. So my son goes down there and they checked him over. You got nothing wrong. God, nothing wrong. Jesus, God. Think what this guy would have done here if you hadn't gone down there, you know. We were elated, you know. Well, here all months, about a month and a half, two months ago, heavy bleeding starts in again. So he called a doctor, he said, uh, get down here. He said, we'll check it. So went down there and said, well, you've got a big kidney stone. All right, what do we do about it? So well, as soon as the bleeding starts, stops, he said, we'll take it out. Well, the bleeding didn't stop. So now what? Well, they gave him some kind of medications and stuff. He said, we'll have to do some further tests and see what's going on here. Well, when they started doing tests and did a biopsy, they found out that the cancer had already gone into his lymph nodes. And, stuff, you know, I mean, Jesus, God, you know, and uh, I, I hold that against them. My sister-in-law doesn't believe that, you know, but I, th I think they, they missed the boat somewhere, you know, and so I said, well, he said, we're sorry to tell you, so you have cancer in the, in the lymph nodes and, and stuff, so I have to take some chemotherapy. They might hopefully, hopefully have stopped it, you know, maybe, but we don't know. It already gone into his bladder and they had to take three tumors out of his bladder. And the doctor right off the bat says, well, these are cancer tumors. And my sister-in-law said, what? He said, yeah. I said, they're cancer. He said, well, be sure, doctor, please. So he has the things analyzed and, you know, biopsy tested, and it was not cancer. So hopefully, maybe, you know, it might be a save. Yeah. We don't know, but, uh, you know. It is astounding. You were saying how probably we've benefited in our medical technologies, but, you know, it's still... Uh, uh, roll the dice. He's practicing. Yeah. <laughs> they would make a lot of missed calls. Yeah, yeah, a lot of missed calls. And I believe personally, I told my sister-in-law the other day, I said, I think this was, they missed something. She said, what? What did you say? And I said, I think they missed something. She said, no. They told her. I, I, I was there. I went down at the USC there. And, and the doctor, well, there was a man doctor, but a woman doctor, too. She's a head, one of the head ones down there. I said, doctor, how did you miss this? How come you come back here a year later and you tell us this? When you said there was nothing, oh, well, this was a hidden cancer. It's inside the kidney itself, and we couldn't see it. I said, but there was a tumor on the outside, too. How come you, you know? And the doctors up here, they're, yeah. they're Yeah, I uh, said, the doctors up there said it was, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, this one was one of the toughest ones we've ever had to, right. to analyze. Well, that's all bull in my estimation. Yeah. They're covering up for what they did. Yeah. But my yeah. son is paying the price, you know. Yeah. And... Uh, it's just one of those unfortunate things. You can't, what are you going to do about it, you know? Nothing. Nothing. No. You just hope that. Yeah, I just hope. Now. Yeah. I hope. He's feeling better now, Jody. He's uh, doing better. Yeah, he seems like it. Yeah, he's got a little color coming back. He's losing all his hair. Chemotherapy. Yeah, but, so is it the lymphoma oh. that folks are talking about? Pardon? Is it the lymphoma? The, no, no, it's no. a, no, it's no, not lymphoma. It, it, but when, it, when cancer uh, develops in your system, it does move. 
Right. It's the ones that go through lymph, lymph nodes. It's not really lymphoma, but that yeah. means it's metastasized. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then it, it goes to a new stage. So, but they, they have uh, successfully. I mean, some people respond. And mm -hmm. Some people don't. That's know. what you said. You, so you have to give it a try. You know, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. They couldn't operate us. You know, uh, if they'd have done it a year ago, there would have been no problem. You know. But now, she says, if we operate now, she says, it'll be the end. It'll just take off before, you know, you can do anything about it. So, so you know, life is cheap. Yeah, now they've got uh, new uh, chemo that maybe are soon. I know they are already maybe doing trials with it, but now they have the kind of targets, the, the drug targets the cancer cells. That's what it does, yeah. So that it's very focused. Doesn't do this real number. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, two treatments, the first two were six hours apiece. You sit in the chair, you know, and they just feed you this stuff, six hours, and then six hours, then you wait two weeks, an hour and a half, an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, now he just did the second six hours here, finished the uh, day before. I uh, was, uh, let's see, it was uh, Wednesday or Thursday, finished the last two treatments. And I had the understanding that they were going to do this and then maybe do some more uh, MRI and just see where it's at. But apparently they're going to do more. I don't know. I just don't know what they're going to do. So, But anyway, it's, uh, yeah. it's the way it is. And, yeah. yeah. When we came in, of course, the rest of the fishermen, you know, heard about it. And then they came down here and said, oh, boy, we want to get out of that <laughs> miserable country up north, you know, like Newport, <laughs> Oregon. I mean, what is miserable yeah. winters? What, what did you? Did you want to, or I, did you want for him to keep? I don't know. I think this one should be for him to keep. Yeah. Yeah. So you want you can fill it in again, so you have a record of it. Cool. That's usually the way it's done, so that you. Um, I can copy And we that. will, you know, we will stay in touch with you. I can copy that one. Or yeah. It's just it? to put yeah. your put your name. We need. Oh, so Patrick, uh, we need today's date right here. Yeah. Again, Would you want to put it in here? Yeah. Today's okay. date, oh, the right date? There, right there yeah. on that oh. line. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Would you say Well, I'd say you're, you're kind of like one of those little the scouts that come along and say, there's big ones here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.